Hello. All righty. Just give it a quick second while everyone's kind of popping in here because this number is just exciting. Climbing up. Ooh. All right. Do -do. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and get started and then people will kind of keep popping in. But so hi, everybody. Hello, Nicole. Hello, Julia. Uh, we are really lucky today for our vir first virtual kids event at Powerhouse to have Nicole speak here, here for her book Foreverland. And we also have Julia Fierro, a fellow author who's going to be moderating for us. So I'm Megan. I'm a kids book specialist at Powerhouse. If you've ordered any books from us um, over the past couple of weeks, you've probably talked to me over through email or over the phone. Um, so yeah, thank you guys so much for being here and joining us. Um, it means a lot to everybody at Powerhouse to have our community supporting us in this kind of rough time that we're all in. Um, it's really important, like Nicole said, to have some social interaction, even if it's through the internet like this right now. Um, so just some quick housekeeping things before we get started, just in case there's anybody here who hasn't been in one of these little Zoom webinar guys before. Um, so you'll see in the audience a couple of different functions along the bottom of your screen that you'll be able to use. Um, so we've got the polls function, which should have popped up when you first came in. Um, Nicole has been kind enough to come up with some really fun poll questions that are related to theme parks and on theme with Foreverland. So if you guys want to go ahead and answer those, I will close the polling at the, towards the end of the event and you'll get to see kind of how it all shakes out and what everyone's favorite treats and rides are. So that'll be nice and fun. We also have a really fun thing. If you go into the chat right now, I'm about to send a message to everyone that's got the link to where you can buy a copy of Foreverland, as well as copies of Julia's books for adults um, in the chat. So you can go ahead and check that out. And in the order comments section, if you put your name, Nicole has been awesome enough to offer to sign some book plates and make an acrostic out of your name. So if you put your name in there, uh, Nicole will send those your way as well, since we can't really do an in-person signing right now. Um, yeah, so I'll post that link again at the end. Um, so don't feel like you're going to have to scramble to scroll back up through the chat. The last other button that you need to know is the Q&A button. Um, that is where uh, you can click on that and put some questions in uh, that Julia will ask Nicole a little bit later in the event. And actually one more, <laughs> our raise hand button. So in the audience, you have a button on the bottom that says raise hand. In a little bit when we do some trivia about theme parks, um, Nicole is going to ask you a question. You can go ahead and raise your hand and I will unmute you. Um, and once you're unmuted, then you'll be able to ask Nicole your question. Um, so that is it in terms of the housekeeping of the functions of Zoom. And now I'm going to introduce Julia, our lovely moderator for today. Just a little bit about her. Um, Julia is the author of the novels The Gypsy Moth Summer and Cutting Teeth both for adults. She also is working on a third book. Um, it's coming out in October called Santa Monica. Awesome. Keep an eye out for that for any of the adults that might be joining with their kids. Um, she has also had work published in The Millions, Poets and Writers, BuzzFeed, Glamour, Flavorwire, and others. And she is the founder of the Sackett Street Writers Workshop um, that is a good friend of Powerhouse and has had some uh, meetings and events with us. So yeah, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Julia. Yay. Thanks so much. Um, and thank you so much to Powerhouse who really, for those of you who don't live in New York City, um, you should definitely check out their website. You can buy you know any book you want on their website and it's just a really amazing 
um, community. I mean, it's, it's the kind of place that allows us to have fun, you know, necessary book community um, in New York. So such an important place. So thank you for supporting Nicole and inviting me. Um, so I'm very excited to introduce Nicole, who I met when we were um, publishing our maybe our first books together, I think. So it was kind of exciting and scary. And um, I just, I, I think my favorite thing about Nicole, as many of you will see when you read Foreverland, is she has the best sense of humor. She makes me laugh like no other author. Um, and even, you know, reading the book, I felt like my 12 year old Julia self was laughing, you know, just like, it's just, um, it's, she's able to be, her characters are smart and also very funny. So um, I'm just going to read a quick snippet from her bio because she's done so much. Um, Nicole C. Keir is the author of the memoir, Now I See You, which is an incredibly funny, touching memoir for all the adults out there. Um, her books for children include the middle grade novel Foreverland and the chapter series, The Fix It Friends and the middle grade series, The Startup Squad, co-written with Brian Weisfeld, maybe Weisfeld, Weisfeld. Um, her essays appear in all the great places that you would dream of having your essays published. And um, she teaches nonfiction at Columbia University and the NYU School of Professional Studies. And um, a native of New York, she received a BA from Yale an MA from Columbia and a red nose from the San Francisco School of Circus Arts, which is obviously the most important of all of those degrees. She lives in Brooklyn with her husband, three children and two teddy bear hamsters. And um, a little bit about Foreverland, which, wow, I really had so much fun reading this book. I immediately bought several copies for all, um, the young, you know, the young people in my life who have the busiest brains, because it's really about a thinker, right? Um, so, um, hold on a second. I have many screens open here. Where's my little forever rant, Foreverland bio? Sorry, guys. This is my first Zoom book launch. All right. You're doing great. <laughs> so, a little bit about Foreverland. Margaret is tired of everything always changing, which I think we can all relate to right now. Middle school has gone from bad to worse. Her best friend is becoming a stranger and her family, well, it's not even a family anymore. So Margaret is running away to Foreverland, her favorite amusement park. Hiding out there is trickier than she expects until she meets Jamie, a thrill-seeking, fast-thinking runaway who teaches Margaret how to stay one step ahead of the captain of security. And I'm going to stop there, even though I do want to give away all of the great details, but it's a really fun read. And um, anyways, I'm, I'm really happy that you wrote it because I think it's going to make a lot of readers happy. Yeah. Yay! Thank you so much. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Powerhouse. Thank you, wonderful attendees tuning in through Zoom. I am so excited to be here. Um, I know we are locked up in our houses, housebound. I know we are sick of being in our houses, but I hope that we will have a lot of fun because this book unfolds in an amusement park. And so I have tried to simulate an amusement park environment for you. Here's what I got. I got popcorn. I have popcorn. I have, oh, this is indispensable. I have cotton candy. I'm going to eat some right now. Wow. Mm, no. <laughs> Melts in your mouth. I'm so sorry. I can't give you some. My plan was to have just buckets of cotton candy of all colors to give to all of you. But, you know, things change. Um, I have icy cold lemonade, which you want to wash your cotton candy with. And I have 
a marvelous book <laughs> I'm quite fond of. It's called Foreverland. So, oh, the comments are lighting up. People are very excited yeah. about the treats. This is really exciting. So, guys, here's what we're going to do um, Foreverland takes place, as I said, in the amusement park Foreverland. So, using a feat of modern technology, let's hope this works, I'm going to get you in a Foreverland state of mind, people. Get ready for this. Oh boy. We are going to, um, hold on guys. I promise this is going to be a feat. Ignore my messy, um, ignore my messy desktop. Okay. Whoa. Oh my God. We're at an amusement park. Everyone can hear that, right? It's not just me. Okay. So, welcome to Foreverland. I'm going to try to remind you guys what it's like to be in a super fun amusement park. Because right now, obviously, we are far, far from an amusement park. And so, in order to do that, I'm going to show you some amazing pictures. Let's see. Whoa, so this is my daughter in, can you guess it? You probably recognize it, Disneyland, what they call the happiest place on earth. This child does not look like the happiest child on earth, which is something I think often happens when you uh, go to amusement parks. There's a lot of waiting. I think she had probably waited for an hour and a half to get on It's a Small World or something like that. So there we are, the happiest place on earth. Now, when you guys probably, your first amusement park ride was probably a little flying elephant ride like this. This is a flying Elmo in Sesame Place with my son when he was so tiny. And it was his very first ride he ever went on and that's me with him. So in Foreverland, this section of the park, the kids section is called Tot Town. And it has all of those favorite flying elephants and spinning teacups, and, uh, you know, those motorcycles that go up and down, which in the book she calls babies, hell's angels. You get a little older at the amusement parks and maybe you might do a roller derby ride. This is my son many years later in Dollywood, Tennessee, doing a roller derby ride. Okay, games, very important to any amusement park. Um, this is on Governor's Island in New York, and it was an old-fashioned um, carnival show, and we played some games. So lots of people love to play the games. This is my, one of my absolute favorite rides in, all, in every amusement park and every carnival, and it is, of course, the carousel. This is Le Carousel, which is the French carousel you can find in Bryant Park, Manhattan, um, and it actually plays French music, and it's a really old carousel. It's so beautiful. Here's another carousel and a totally wild looking speed demon <laughs> on it. This is actually in Boston, and um, something I always wondered as a kid, and even now, is you see that a uh, little room in the center of the carousel with the mirrors in it. I always wondered what goes on in that secret magic room. And so in Foreverland, um, once you get into the book, you actually get to find out what goes on there. And it's so exciting. Uh, this is a really old fashioned carousel that you actually, it's uh, foot pedaled. So you, you, you pedal it with your own feet Admittedly, not as uh, thrill, thrilling of a ride as the more modernized ones. Uh, here we come to my all-time favorite roller coaster, I mean, amusement park ride. And it is, of course, the Ferris wheel. This is my tiniest daughter, Valentina, when she was a tiny little person. And behind her, you can see my favorite amusement park, ever, which is located in Coney Island, Brooklyn, where I am from, and I've been going there since I was this small, small as she is. And that Ferris wheel um, is my favorite Ferris wheel ever. 
So there you have it. Here's a different look at a Ferris wheel. And if you guys have been on Ferris wheels, this is the angle uh, of approach when you first get in the car. So it's kind of cool under the wheel. I'm about to read a section from the book where they're getting in uh, the Ferris wheel. So I thought this picture might help you uh, get in the mood. This is at the very top of a Ferris wheel. And behind it, you can just make out beautiful Santa Monica, California. This is the Ferris wheel over there in Los Angeles, um, where I know some of you guys are. Lucky, lucky. All right, now we have come to my favorite <laughs> section, the roller coaster pictures, okay? <laughs> This is my daughter and husband on King Dika, um, in New Jersey. And I mean, look at that face. Look at all of those faces. I have to confess here that I am a huge roller coaster wimp. I absolutely mm. am petrified of roller coasters. So you will not see me in any of these fun pictures. <laughs> Here's one in Dollywood, Tennessee, the wild eagle that dangles you from your chest and torso and your legs just hang free. Totally wild. Here's um, one from the Thunderhead, also in Dollywood. <laughs> the girl in the back just cracks me up. It's really a great picture. They're having a lot of fun. And my favorite roller coaster picture, my final photo. Here we are, the mystery mine in Dollywood, Tennessee. You have my children and my husband. I don't, I mean, if you look at this picture, it makes you wonder why do people ride roller coasters? Because it doesn't look like a fun experience. But there you have it. Um, so, are you in an amusement park ma state of mind? Are you having fun? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so to seal the deal, I am now going to play some amusement park trivia with you. It's going to be really fun. Um, to do that, I'm going to have my lovely lady assistant, Valentina Carr, come to the Zoom chamber. Woo! Here she is, the woman of the hour, Valentina. So she is going to read you five questions. She is going to read you five amusement park trivia questions. If you know the answer, you are going to raise your hand using the raise your hand function. And then Megan will call on you by calling out your name. And then you can actually tell us with your voice the answer. We can have about three tries for each one and then we run out of time. Okay, so we know how to play the game. Mm -hmm. Valentina, read them the first question. The first question is, what is the world's tallest roller coaster? What is the world's tallest roller coaster? Ooh, we've got some quick hands here. I'm going to go ahead and allow the first one that I saw to talk. And that looks like it's Jeanne. The King to Ka in um, Six Flags Great Adventure. Um, <laughs> Congrats, you're you right. You got it on the first one. Yes, that's the exact answer. You are completely right. The King Ka in? The King Ka Six Flags Great Adventure in Jackson, New Jersey. Yeah, New Jersey. It is 45 stories high. I mean, that is really, really, really high. <laughs> and as I said, my daughter and husband rode this ride, which I wasn't with them or else I think I probably would have thrown myself in front of them and not allowed them to do it. Okay. Amazing, you guys are geniuses. Quarantine's agreeing with you. Okay, number two. Formula Rose are the world's fastest roller coaster, which is what top speed? What is the top speed of Formula Rosa, which is the world's fastest roller coaster? Ooh, okay, yeah, also apologies, friends. Um, the names that pop up on here is the attendees are usually the parents or whoever registered. So when I do call on you, Go ahead and say your name before you answer. Uh, so I think first to pop up on this one was Maureen McLaughlin. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute you and let us know your name. Um, my name is Moa, and I have my brother with me, Richard. Hello. Um, 
Is it 100 mile, 100 per miles? One, so close. That is the closest. Very, very, very close. You are very much in the ballpark. Do we want to try someone else? Good try, guys. Really good. You're so Let's close. See, so close. Who else had a hand up? We also had Melissa Hardy had a hand up. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute you, too. And go ahead and let us know your name. Wow. Melissa Hardy? <laughs> Do you know the answer? Melissa Hardy. Melissa Hardy is someone I know quite well. She's her sister. <laughs> <laughs> She's my sister. Um, my Okay, let's see. We can try. We also have um, Emily who has a hand up here. So we can go ahead and unmute Emily and see if Emily knows the answer. Um, 120 miles per hour. That is super. That is super even more. Close. Hot, 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 hot. You're Whoa. getting that. Is that Geronimo? 130. I took a guess. Yes. All right, you're super, super, super close. Okay. Oh, who is it? Oh, it is. Good. All right. Want to try one more guess? You guys are getting so close every Let's time. See, we've got. Closer and closer. That is too fast. We have Tara Doyle who also has a hand up. Let's see. Go ahead and let us know. 140 miles per hour. So <laughs> okay, I'm going to tell you the answer now, guys. Formula Rosa in Ferrari World in Abu Dhabi reaches 149 miles um, per hour. Too fast. Protective glasses. You have to wear protective glasses. That's <laughs> how fast you don't want, you know, like a bird feather impaling your eyeball. Your eyeball popping out. Look at that. <laughs> okay, question As number happened. three. Are we ready? Whoa. What is the oldest continually operating amusement park in the U.S.? Okay, what's the amusement park that has been continually operating for the longest time? The oldest one in America. Anybody know? Let's see. We've got... Okay, uh, we have uh, Jean popped up again, so I'm going to go ahead and unmute you and tell us your name. Okay, so um, my name is Jesse. I'm going to be answering the questions. So um, it is Cedar Point, right? So close. Cedar Point is a very old amusement park, and in fact, it is what I thought the answer to this question was, but it is technically not the oldest continually operating. Very, very close. Want to try another person? Yeah, let's see. We've got um, Maureen McLaughlin has a hand up. We can go ahead and unmute Maureen. Uh, I did Coy Island. Oh, how I wish it was Coney Island, which is my favorite amusement park. Uh, Coney Island is so old, and yet there's one even older. This is so hard. You want to try one more person, then I'll tell you. It's so hard, guys. Yeah, let's try. Um, Emily has a hand up. Sorry, I was going to say Coney Island. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Does anyone else have a hand up? Coney Island is very popular. Let's see. We've got Tara Doyle has a hand up. Let's see. Um, back in a bacon. Oh, can you repeat it? Back in a bacon. So close, guys. These are all very old, amazing amusement parks. The answer is Lake Compounds in Bristol, Connecticut. Lake Compounds. Who ever it heard of it? It opened in 1840. Six. 1846. Wow. Okay. You guys are amazing. We have two more questions. Uh, question number four. Here we go. What is hidden inside the 
Matterhorn Ride in Disneyland. Okay. Disneyland. Matterhorn Ride. Something is hidden inside of it. What is that? Hmm. It's a really hard one. one. <laughs> see, Maureen was speedy on the hand with this one, so let's see. I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you. Um, I heard they have cats walk. I'm walking around. Is it cats? So fascinating you should say that because um, they do have cats in Disneyland. Apparently, they have quite a number of feral wild cats that help to catch the mice and rats. Um, and that is a true fact. That is a, one of these like myths that is, happens to be true. A very rare fact that you knew, congratulations, but it is not what is hidden in the Matterhorn. Good guess. Let's see, does anybody else have a guess for this one? I'm not seeing any other hands. At the All right, we will tell you, tell them. I mean, I wouldn't even guess this. A basketball court. Small one, just one hoop. True story. True story. We just actually saw it on the this documentary so called The Imagineers um, that we watched about Disneyland. And there is a one hoop half court basketball court in the middle of the Matterhorn that the staff can use for their breaks. So fun. Okay, last question of them all. Oh boy. <laughs> She's getting too much popcorn. <laughs> oh boy. Are you ready? The last question, question five, is it's a true or false question. It's the only true or false question on this page. Or both pages, I guess. So. <laughs> um, true or false. If a baby's born in Disneyland, they get a free lifetime pass. If a baby is born in Disneyland, do you get a free lifetime pass? Yes no. or no? What do you think? Oh, we've got lots of hands <laughs> up for this one. Let's sure see if we so. can get somebody that we haven't heard from yet. Okay, how about we have an Alicia Scott. I'm gonna go Your internet ahead. Internet connection is unstable. No. I'm gonna <laughs> no. unmute. I'm just gonna grab my fingers. Okay, Alicia, <laughs> you have an answer for us. <laughs> I um, do. I think it's false. All right. Do Hello. Hello. Oh, looks like we're having a small little glitch on Nicole's side. Oops. Oh, hello, are we back? Oh, yeah, we can see you now. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. I think I just lost you for a second. Let me... Now we're back, I think. Yeah, now so we're we back. Had, uh, um, Alicia had said that they thought that it was false. Oh, one moment. Let me see if I can... I have to find my... Oh, there you guys are. Okay, so false. Is it false? What is the answer? The answer is true or false. If a baby well, born what's in, the answer? I know. If a baby born in Disneyland, they get a free pass. The answer is false. Four babies have been born in Disneyland and none got passes. None. False. Oh, Good job, Alicia. <laughs> Great job, guys. Great trivia round. Give a hand of applause. And you join in the other Zoom chamber. All right, so now you are in an amusement park state of mind, and I'm going to read to you a short excerpt from Foreverland. I have a special uh, assistant who is joining me for this portion. This is my daughter, King Dakar rider. Roller coaster lover. And survivor. I'm survivor. <laughs> she did survive. So we're going to read, she's going to help me read a little excerpt from the book. This is from the middle of the book. And all you need to know is that Margaret, the protagonist, is uh, trying to escape being caught by the captain of security. And a mysterious boy, whose name is Jamie, has asked her to meet him. Uh, at the Ferris wheel, but she doesn't know why and she doesn't know when. Okay, here we go. 
The line's short, and in just a few minutes, I'm at the front. You want a rock? The ride operator asks, and I'm about to say no as clearly as I can, because even though I like the Ferris wheel just fine, I really do not like rocking cars. I can't possibly stress this enough. Rocking cars and I go together like peanut butter and someone who is really allergic to peanut butter. We do not go together at all. We should be kept far, far apart. Before I can tell her that though, someone is grabbing my hand and pulling me onto the car that's waiting in front of me. I'm so surprised I don't have time to protest. And I find myself sitting opposite boy wonder as the door to the car clangs shut. Nice face, he says, grinning. I'm totally confused because nice face is not how you usually start a conversation with anyone, especially someone you hardly know. Then I remember that I had my face painted and it makes more sense. While I am trying to figure out how you respond to nice face, Jamie says, You're right on time. I am speechless. It's not that I don't have anything to say, it's that I have too much. How can I be right on time when you never said when to meet? Also, just a minor question, what do you want? And while we're on the subject, are you the dangerous kind of weird or the harmless kind? But there's only one question that I need an answer to immediately. Is this a rocking car, I blurt out? I can't go on those. The question gets answered before he has a chance to reply. The Ferris wheel lurches forward and it is immediately clear what kind of car we're on. Oh no, I whimper. Oh no, 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 no. I, I can't, I can't be on here. My heart is racing and everything sounds muffled like I'm under a waterfall. As we're lifted in the air, our car rocks back and forth except that rocking is not the right word for it. Rocking is what you do to a baby when you're trying to lull it to sleep. Rocking is gentle. Our car is swinging like a yo-yo. My arms fly out to the sides. I stick my fingers through the grating on the windows and I clench as tight as I can. My heart is pounding so fast that I can't even make out a beat anymore. Just a roar of thump, 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 thump. Jamie's not smiling anymore. His dark eyebrows are furrowed together and his big eyes get even bigger. Are you okay? I shake my head, but with the car swinging, it's too much shaking and I feel a big wave of nausea hit me. So I close my eyes. I have to get off, tell them, make them stop it. I'm sorry, for real. I didn't know you were scared. I hear him say. But there's only one way off of this thing and that's to go around. He's right, of course. What goes up must come down unless you're talking about my last meal. In that case, what goes down <laughs> must come up. I'm suddenly really glad I haven't eaten anything all morning. I'm also suddenly furious. Being furious actually makes me feel less scared, so I go with it. This is totally your fault. I snap open my eyes. I didn't want to go in a rocking car. You didn't even give me a chance to choose. What's wrong with you? Now that's the million dollar question. Many have tried to figure it out, but all have failed. It's not funny, I growl. You're like a sociopath. Possible, he says, smiling. Of course, I'm not the one sleeping in a haunted house. At that moment, the Ferris wheel freezes. Huh, I stammer. That's what you'd be cool with the rocking car, he says. You're sleeping in a haunted house, and that's hardcore. You got guts. So I just figured, you know, nothing scares you. I'm not, I mean, I don't know what you're talking about. He laughs again. <laughs> if that's your act for the captain, it needs a lot of work, he says. I know you were in the haunted house. I saw you. Hold on, I tell him as our car comes to a standstill in midair. I have questions. Shoot, he says. Okay, well, so if you saw me at the haunted house after closing, then you obviously spent the night here too. Jamie says nothing, just raises his eyebrows at me. I'm waiting for the question. I sigh heavily, then say, did you sleep here last night? Have you been here a while? What's your deal? Jamie starts cracking the knuckles on his right hand, tugging on each finger in a way that sets my teeth on edge. I'm crashing here for a bit, he says. Like you, only I'm not as hardcore as you. No way I could sleep in the haunted house with the skeletons. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's perfect. What'd you do, take the last tour then hide somewhere when they turn the lights out? I don't want to be flattered, but I can't help it. I am. Yeah, under the bed. He whistles. Nice. So you're crashing here for a bit? 
I ask, which means what exactly? A few days? I've been here a while. He says it like he's being modest, but I can tell he's really proud of himself. Almost long enough to wear out my welcome, but I got security on my scent until the captain found your backpack. Now he's all revved up again. You know about my backpack? Listen, here's the deal. Jamie says. I know everything that goes on here, but the truth is not much goes on. I've been here long enough that nothing surprising ever happens. I've seen it all. I've seen two different people propose on the catapult. Seriously? He nods. <laughs> yeah, and they both dropped the rings and never found them. Serves them right for being so stupid. I laugh in spite of myself. I've seen 47 people throw up, most of them on vertical vortex. I've seen six people lose their bathing suits in Tsunami Falls. I helped 10 different lost boys find their parents in Tot Town. And I've been on the shooting star so many times, I lost count. So I'm sort of over it. So why don't you just go home? Aren't your parents looking for you? He laughs, this bitter, hollow laugh, and says, No, they're not. There you go, a little glimpse of Foreverland. A round of applause for my lovely assistant, daughter and rider of King Daka. Yeah. All right, so. That was a wonderful that, performance. Ah, yes, she's quite an actrice. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I, I think that we'll have some questions now, right, Julia? Yes, first, just a few questions from me, and then I'm sure that our wonderful, we have so many people attending, this is very exciting, that they are thinking of their questions and um, getting ready to uh, write them into the Q&A, whatever we call that, button. <laughs> <laughs> so um that was so much fun i'm really impressed also with the reading performance wow <laughs> and the and the child participation oh, yes and your kids you know i am i'm a little jealous because i write for adults and my children are always wondering like you know what does she do in those books and you've written many books for you know, children, kids, your, your, your own children's ages. And, um, and I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit, obviously our kids inspire us, whether, you know, we write for middle grade or younger or even our adult books. So can you um, give us a little, a little bit about um, who inspired this book? Yes. I can. So yeah, I like to say I steal all my best stuff from my kids. Um, so for this particular book, I, um, I really owe a lot of its creation to my son, who is not a guest participant, because he's 15. And when you're 15, it's no longer interesting to be a special guest <laughs> your mother's virtual Zoom book launch. Back to life, I guess. So, um, but he did give me like an hour tutorial on how to work Zoom, so I guess that counts. <laughs> Even the photos. Right. So the book was inspired because when he was 12 years old, he or almost 12, when he was 11, about to turn 12, he went through this period where he felt really nostalgic for his childhood. And he kept saying to me, I don't want to grow up. I don't want to get any older. I don't want to be a grown up. And I thought this was such a peculiar thing because I thought, you know, kids always want to get older really quickly, right? They want to wear right. mascara and curse and drink latte. And rush. Yeah. yeah. And I was in a rush. I wanted to get old as fast as I possibly could. So I thought it was a funny thing um, that he was feeling. But then I uh, started thinking about it and thinking about Peter Pan, the story of Peter Pan. And I realized that that story takes place at, during Wendy's last night in the nursery, right? So uh, Wendy is having her last night where she can still be a kid and sleep in the nursery with the other kids. And the next day she's going to be considered a grown up, you know, or a teenager as we would now say. And so this is her last night of childhood. And it is no coincidence that during this last night of childhood, this is when this epic adventure comes. This is when Peter Pan comes to her window. And this is when she says, yes, I'm going to fly out the window. I'm going to have this amazing, incredible, epic odyssey. It's sort of like her last gasp of childhood. So I was thinking about this and I was taking a walk with my son who was about to turn 12 and I was uh, saying I'd love to write a Peter Pan story for kids and, and he thought that was a good idea. 
And um, we talked about it and he helped me sort of develop the idea of doing a modern sort of Peter Pan story. And then I said, the only thing is I can't think of what would Neverland be, right? Like what would be the funnest place that you could imagine going where every childhood wish is fulfilled, where you could, you know, consort with mermaids and fairies and pirates. What is that in 2020? And he said, like, duh, mom, it's an amusement park. And I was like, ah, that's right. Oh my gosh, that's exactly it. And so because of that, that is exactly where the inspiration came. And then for some more of the details, you know, I used my kids a lot. My daughter, who you just met, is a super big roller coaster lover. My son kind of likes roller coasters, but has, you know, isn't a big fan always. So I liked their, I'm really scared of roller coasters. So I, I explored some of those relationships. But for the main idea, it was really um, my son. Wow, that's great. Yeah, sometimes what's obvious is hard for adults to see. Yeah. You know? and, and it's good to have some smart children around to remind us. Um, that's really wonderful. And I really, um, I love the, the way you talk about uh, Peter Pan and especially Wendy, because there really is something special about this particular age. I have a son who's a, almost 12 and, you know, middle school is even though I went through it myself, it really is the middle. Like, it's really like a sort of unknown forming place where you a lot of change and a lot of looking at who am I, who should I be, who, you know, who, do, who does the world want me to be? Um, so I'm wondering um, maybe if you could talk a little bit more about Margaret and you know, just the sort of the, you know, the anxiety that she's experiencing um, in, you know, in her family and with her sister and all the change and her best friend. I loved this, this line. It just really, in middle school, this is from Margaret in the book. In middle school, you should be yourself, but only if that self is like everyone else. Otherwise, be someone different. Um, so maybe you could, could you talk a little bit about that quote and, and how it kind of, you know, like starts her journey through her stay at uh, Foreverland and then without giving anything away, you know. I would never. <laughs> um, yeah, so Margaret's the main character. She's 12 years old and everything is terrible at the start of the book. Pretty much just everything is terrible in her life at home. She uh, lost her best friend. Um, her best friend is still alive, but just sort of ditched her, ghosted, ghosted her. Um, and her sister, who she used to be really close with, is ignoring her because she's older and she's like has a boyfriend and is busy. And um, uh, there's been this mysterious red suitcase by the door, which I won't tell you too much about, but um, her mom is very critical of her and she just feels like she doesn't belong anywhere. She doesn't belong in her family. She doesn't belong in school. She likes weird things that other people don't like, like hand crank music boxes. And, you know, um, she's very anxious. She's a little bit of an eccentric. She marches to the beat of her own drum, but she doesn't feel like she can really be honest about who she is because she doesn't want to be bullied and ridiculed. So um, she doesn't have any friends and she doesn't have these relationships with her family are fading and it's just too much. So she goes to Foreverland because it was a place she always went to every year with her family. And it was a special place for them and they always had a great time. And it was the place they went, um, it was the last place they were really all happy together. So she goes back there. But um, yeah, that line that you read about Margaret and middle school, I think is, is important to the book because what happens in the book is, you know, Margaret is this girl who feels invisible. She says like, I, I feel like I'm, you know, a wallflower except, you know, or like, a, I feel like I'm just like wallpaper. Like people don't see me. Nobody hears me. Nobody sees me. I'm like a, a pinball where I just get batted around from one thing to the next. She doesn't have a lot of voice. And so what she learns through the course of the story is sort of how to be herself. And it turns out like that's a really, she's a really amazing, fun, great, interesting person. But 
she has to kind of leave everything behind to discover that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's such a, I think everyone, you know, goes through that feeling of feeling invisible. And then when you try to be visible, often she gets like maybe a little overexcited or nervous. And then she says something that, that feels to her like the wrong thing. You know, there's a lot of those, she's a real thinker and analyzer, which makes her so interesting to be inside her head in the book, you know? Um, but also, you know, it, it's hard for her, you know, to be worrying and thinking and sort of thinking about what she said and was it the right thing. And so she has this creative tool that she uses that was something that she once shared with her older sister, which are the um, acrostic puzzles. I've never done an acrostic puzzle and I was so excited, you know, and, um, and was really, you know, was really impressed with how you, you, you know, it's this tool that you gave your character to make sense of how she's feeling, to sort of understand what's happening in the moment. And um, it's almost like a safe way to examine all the changes that she's experiencing. Were you, did you do that kind of thing when you were her age or did you have something else or what other, you know, little tools like that, you know, can people, can kids have to sort of escape in the moment and, you know, figure things out. Yeah, Margaret loves to do acrostics. Um, and I actually, I'm going to, I would love to show you this because I'm gonna do something ambitious and share my screen with you again, because I, um, I got amazing acrostics. Let me see if I can do this. From a bunch of kids, um, and I wanted to share some of them with you. Um, I will start by, oops. Oh, sorry guys. I have to go all the way through my fun pictures to get to the acrostics. So um, yeah, in case you don't know what an acrostic poem is, this is what it is. The spine of the poem is a word. And then the first letter of every line uh, is, you know, belonging to that spine. So this one's in the beginning of the book. For a while, I'm dropping off the radar. Everything's so very screwed up, I can't even stand the thought of home. Running away is a lousy idea, but it's also my only idea, and nowhere else will do. So Margaret writes these constantly as a way to kind of calm down and deal with her anxiety. Um, Jamie, who's the mystery boy she, she meets, he um, has different coping strategies for anxiety, for his restlessness, for his like, um, you know, energy. He makes origami constantly and he um does a yo-yo he's a great yo-yo person um i didn't write poetry as a kid but i did love to read constantly and i loved to um sing and perform um so for me those were strategies but the acrostics were fun because i knew i wanted her to be like a poet um and at first i thought maybe i would do haikus but those are actually I don't know, a little challenging and you can't say much because they're so short. I liked how how open these were and I love that it's something kids could do easily. So I wanted to share a few of these that I got from kids because I think they're so fun. This is one that it, it spells screens and it says, Stella, my mom shouts, clearly annoyed. I roll my eyes. She doesn't even know how important it is for me to earn back gems on this new video game. Uh, she won't mind if I play one more time. <laughs> you might guess it's from my daughter, Stella. Here's one from a fan of Pop Rocks. Oh, I love Pop Rocks. Perfectly sweet. Our favorite treat. Pop Rocks are delicious. Really poppy. Only... Oh only, my gosh, they're great. Oh my, oh my gosh, they're great. Crackle in my mouth. Key ingredient in happiness. Sweet treat. Oh, uh, I like all those exclamation points. Here's one about siblings, so annoying, a little insane, but loving and immensely gracious. Nothing would make me trade my great siblings. That one's from Emma. Here's one from Maeve, spelling muffins. My uncle finds fabulous in-style dresses. Nothing stinky. Oh my gosh, that's wonderful. And here's the last one. This one's from Kate. 
Mm. It spells stay home, very apropos. Sheltering helps the healthcare workers and you be smart. Be smart for your sake. Helping out makes everyone safer. Yeah. So those are a few acrostics um, that I was hoping it would inspire kids to write some. I'm glad it did. Yeah, I just thought it would, everybody needs a way, I think, to calm down and cope, especially when you deal with a lot of fears and worries. And I thought this would be um, a fun way for a very creative girl like Margaret to do that. Yeah, and also, I mean, it's a great way to get out of the moment and sort of calm down and be with yourself. But it's also, I think she she realizes new things about herself by doing these little puzzles. You know, it's, it, it, it's like journaling. Yes, writing in a journal, yeah. And, um, you know, it must have been really fun for you to do the puzzles, you know? It's so fun. Yeah, and I've got kind of gotten addicted. I've... <laughs> I kind of can't stop writing them, but uh, it's a good time to be addicted to writing acrostics since I'm home all the time. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be great for, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it with my kids. They don't know it yet, <laughs> but we're doing it. Um, so should I, another question or should we? I think maybe we'll take some kids' questions. Great. All right, let's see. Oh, we got a lot of questions. Um, hmm, we already talked about we already talked about what inspired you to write the book. But that's right. a great question from Mary or whoever Mary's account is being used by. Oh, here's an interesting question um, from Geronimo. Hmm. I already have the book. Good job, Geronimo. Hey, I fun. had fun reading it. Double good job. Did you have fun writing it? Oh, such a good question. I had so much fun. I really did. I've written a lot of books. This was maybe the funnest one to write, mainly because, you know, because of where it takes place. That's why I think it's going to be fun for kids to read, especially right now that we're all stuck at home. Um, it made me feel like I was in an amusement park. I, I got to reimagine all of those amusement parks that I've been to and do something even more fun, not just remember the fun times I had, but then imagine if I could do anything in that amusement park, if there were no limits and no grownups stopping me and it was my park, like all the whole thing for me, what would I do? And that was such a fun thing to write about. Yeah, so much material. I mean, there's so many different parts um, of amusement part that you would want to write about. Um, my, some of the, the haunted house stuff was my favorite. <laughs> that stuff. Um, here's a question from Liam. <clears throat> Sorry. How long does it take to write your book? Ah, an excellent question, Liam. So uh, every book is different. This book took me a really long time because I wrote so many different drafts of it. I wrote a first draft and that also took a while to even write the first draft, but then I kept changing it, right? At first, one of the big things that happened that I had to change was at first it started really, really early, like in the past and Margaret was at home and she was wow, sad and you see her train and she goes to Foreverland and you learn all the reasons that she's leaving home. And my very, very, very wise editor, Aaron said, I love all this stuff, but you should, you know, have her remember that later. Let's start off the story with a bang. Like, let's get to the fun stuff right away. And then we can always, you know, remember the reasons. We can reveal the reasons she left behind later. So I took out so many chapters that I had written up front about, you know, sad stuff. <laughs> and I just tucked them in like secretly later. Um, so many things like that had to happen. There was like, you know, this whole part I had written about going into the theater and there was a rabbit for use for a magic show. And there's like all sorts of things that were really fun, but ultimately didn't belong in the book. So because of that, it took me years to write it. I don't even, I, I lost count, but let's just say probably more than two years. Well, it's pretty good. So I, I'm relieved to hear that it didn't take a less, you know, two years is not, 
even though I know in child years, that's like 40, but for adults, two years to write a book is pretty fast. Um, so good job. Um, yes, my editor says the same thing for all my books. I always, but I find that we need to write all that stuff in the beginning so that we know what's going on with the character to inform us. Um, so that was a good question. And um, here's a great one that's a little bit outside the book, but from Abby. What is your favorite character from a book that you have read and why? Ooh, oh my gosh. So well, that's, sorry, that's a little hard, but. So many books. Okay, I have so many. I'm just gonna do like um, my top few. Um, Ramona, the Ramona series by Beverly Cleary when I was littler, right? Like maybe like under nine. That was my favorite character. My favorite part in Ramona is when she eats one bite of every apple. I loved that. <laughs> <laughs> and her mom comes downstairs and she's like, oh my God, one bite out of every apple. What were you thinking? And her mom is like, the first bite's the best. And I thought, she's right. Yes. Why is she villainized? Yeah. I still think that. True so, to herself. She's, she's yeah. so great. And then um, from other books, I loved Judy Bloom. When I was like this age, when I was 12, I, lo I read all the Judy Bloom books. I recently reread Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret with my daughter. Um, another main character's name is Margaret. I should say my mother's name is Margaret also. Um, uh, that's not why I named this character Margaret. It turns out that the real Wendy in real life was named Margaret. She was a little girl named Margaret who died when she was five. Um, and she invented the name Wendy because she used to call the author of Peter Pan. She couldn't say his name, which was James Barry. So she would call him Wendy Wendy. And he named Wendy oh, Wendy no idea. in honor of her. And now we have the name Wendy. Fun facts. Well, I'm full of them. So um, yeah, I love Judy Bloom, and particularly Are You There, God? Yeah, Margaret. that's my favorite too. Yeah. yeah. Um, here's another question from Miranda and Quentin. What are some of your favorite middle grade novels to read that feel similar to Foreverland? Mm -hmm. uh, for example, this book reminded us a little of from the mixed up files of Mrs. Basil E. Frankweiler. Oh, two people yes. again that have already read the book. That's very exciting. So that book from the mixed up files <clears throat> Uh, was a huge inspiration, really big inspiration. In case you don't know from the title, that's the book where the kids run away and they live in the Metropolitan Museum. Oh, yes, yes. So that is, and I remember watching that, it was like an after, it was a movie on TV when I was a kid and I just like, whoa, it really blew my mind. <laughs> it made a very deep impression. I grew up in the city, I went to the Met a lot and so I just thought that would be phenomenal. So that yeah. was, a huge inspiration for this book. Um, definitely, you smart, you smart kids. So uh, what books do I think are similar? Um, some books that I really love um, that I've read with my kids recently, Rebecca Stead's books, uh, When You Reach Me, um, I think is very similar. And um, it's a very New York City-ish book, which is something I loved about it. But it's exciting. It's such an exciting book with a lot of mystery in it, but it has so much emotion. And mm. as a mother, I would like be crying and, you know, my daughter didn't understand why. Um, that's a good one. Um, her other books are wonderful too, like Liar and Spy are great. And um, I love, um, you know, Sharon Draper's book. It's, uh, she's written a lot of wonderful books, but um, Out of My Mind is much, um, heavier because it's about more heavy subjects, but it has this kind of, you know, you're in her mind. Um, and I think a lot of, um, in this book, Foreverland, you really look at things through Margaret's point of view and you're in her mind a lot. So I think that is similar yes. too. Yeah. But I also think, honestly, you know, I feel like it is similar to the Judy Bloom books because it is this first person, um, she's speaking in I again. And, you know, Judy Bloom, what I loved about her is she's so funny. I mean, her books are so funny, yeah. but they are also um, so honest. And so, yeah. you know, I would hope that Foreverland is, you know, like that. And funny in the way that the characters, a lot of it is sort of inside 
you know, inside her head, the way that she's sort of thinking about herself and making fun of herself, sometimes a little too harshly. But um, I just think it's really, you know, I think that uh, middle grade readers deserve, you know, smart, uh, thoughtful protagonists and that it's exciting to read a book where, um, you know, the adult writer is trusting that the kids are gonna get it. You know, their brains are important and busy. Um, okay, let's see another question. Um, what is your favorite part in the book Foreverland? What was your favorite part? Oh, what is my favorite yeah, part? In your own book. That's from Wow, that is hard. Um, I like all of them. Other people asked it. It's a very popular question. Okay. Okay, so I am going to tell you that the part that Julia had mentioned about the haunted house is really one of my favorite parts. Um, I, I will root it a little bit by saying that Margaret has a sleepover in the haunted house. And that was one of the first things I thought of on my walk with my son. As soon as he said, you should have Neverland should be an amusement park. And I thought instantly, oh my God, she could sleep in the haunted house. Wow. Like with Dracula and the skeletons and the zombies, you know, because it's like a house and, you know, it could be like her living in this house with all the creepy creatures. So that was the, one of the first parts I knew I wanted to write. And it was so fun to imagine what it would be like to sleep in a haunted house. So I would say that's one of my favorite parts. Okay. Wow. Yeah. I thought that too, because as a kid, I was too scared. <laughs> to go to Inside the Haunted House, but now as an adult, I love scary stuff. And so I, I really was very excited about that. Um, okay, let's see. Um, there's one up here, hold on. Here's from Kimberly McCright. Ooh. Very excited for her book coming out for adults. Um, who is your favorite character in Foreverland and why? Ah, so, I have to say, like, you know, I always feel like I can't choose favorites among my characters, except there's always like a supporting character who is my yeah. favorite. Like, you know, right. Margaret, I love because there's so much of myself and her and my kids and Jamie, so much of my kids. But the, my, the character that I think is the funnest, who I love, is a character named Belle. So I don't think I outright mentioned this, but, uh, or I sort of explained, it is a... It, Foreverland, you might not even guess it, but at the end of it, you'll see that is a loosely, it's a loose retelling of Peter Pan. So um, each of the characters has some kind of connection to Peter Pan that is very loose and modernized. But I really wanted Tinkerbell in there because I think Tinkerbell is such a yes. good character. So Belle is this teenager. She's mm -hmm. super punk rock. She wears black steel-toed Doc Martin boots in the dead of summer. Oh, she has lip rings and eyebrow rings and purple lipstick and she is terrifying to Margaret. She is super, <laughs> super jealous in the same way that Tinkerbell was very protective of Peter Pan and jealous yeah. of Wendy. She's like super, super jealous and protective. Um, but she also helps Jamie enormously. Like she's the reason Jamie can, you know, uh, get by. But um, she's my favorite character. She's like really, like almost evil, but of course you'll see she has a good heart. So I love her. You have to get like halfway through the book mm -hmm. to get to her. So, so that's just a word to the wise. She's fun. Yeah, that's great. Wow, that's so great. Okay, one last question and then <clears throat> some more fun stuff is gonna happen. Yeah. I think okay. we, did everyone take polls? Cause we can also see our poll results when we're done. Yeah, so right now you guys, do your polls, okay, I filled it out and now I'm sort of second guessing some of my answers. I might have to fill it out again. Um, here's a great question, <clears throat> sorry. Um, from Emma, what books are you reading with your children right now? Ooh, okay, so I have been reading with my daughter, Valentina. Besides the Foreverland, obviously. I actually, truthfully, I just finished reading it to her last night. Yeah, I did. I really did read it to her. And it was funny because she said to me as I was reading it, mommy, do you, would you change anything about this book? <laughs> if you could. And I said, no, I'm 
And I really just, like, I just finished it. And then she kept saying, what about that part? (laughs) She's a critic. What about that part? (laughs) (laughs) And it made me very nervous. Like, why do you think I should have changed that part? I don't know. It's too late now. So I did just finish that with her. But previous to that, and now starting today, we have been reading all of the Harry Potter. We finished, we just finished book five. So that's what that's Emma's cool. reading. She mentioned it. She said she is reading all the Harry Potter books. Yeah. Yeah. And then I have been reading with, um, my older daughter really reads on her own, but occasionally I force myself and, uh, like I force her to listen to me, read her something. And, um, we were reading star girl by Jerry Spinelli, oh, which yeah, is a, nice. a movie of it now. Yeah. All right. So well, I that- hope everybody's reading. This is a great time to read. Great yeah, time. Yeah. And you know, if you, um, and I think Megan mentioned this, but because we're wrapping up, I'll remind you that if you have bought a copy of the book and you would like me to inscribe it for you and autograph it for you, I can do that. I have really cool book plates. They're stickers, Foreverland stickers. And I can, if you send me a message, um, through my website or social media or email, if you have it, I will write an acrostic of your name, Julia. I can't write it right now, but I'm going to work on it. <laughs> well, my book is waiting there to be signed, so I'm excited for my acrostic sticker to put in my book. Yeah. I want to go ahead and post in the chat one more time the link. And you can also, when you go to check out on the Powerhouse site, there's an order comments section in checkout. And if you put your name in there, we'll pass it along to Nicole, too, and make sure she gets it. And as well as, you know, messaging her, emailing her directly. And I'm going to go ahead and click end polling. So everyone should see the results now. So everybody can see what the favorites were. Wow, a lot of roller coaster riders, brave people. Whoa, yes. Yes, oh, coaster wins by a landslide. That's exciting. I love it. Not a lot of consensus on the favorite treats, though. It's a real mixed bag, you guys. Well, they're all pretty good. Interesting. (laughs) They're all delicious. (laughs) On behalf of Powerhouse, um, thank you so much, Nicole and Julia, for joining us. And thank you, everyone in the audience. Um, I posted that link one more time. And if you guys loved Nicole, loved this awesome event, um, want to support us support support some local authors the best way to do that is to go ahead to that link and buy the books because that helps everyone out and you guys get some fun stuff to read while we're all stuck at home yeah and it's a I'm great really, gift too for, for, for out there i have to say julia has written two beautiful books already the gypsy moth summer and cutting teeth and you guys need to read too um, and if you're going to read, you should read great books. You will devour these. So that's a plug for Julia's two books. Thank you. Thanks <laughs> so much, everyone, for joining us. And have a good rest of your Sunday. Thanks, Thanks everybody. See you later. Bye.